I'm Michael Weber, Artistic Director of Chicago's Porchlight Music Theater. Today is another special edition of Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio with our special guest, award-winning actor Angela Ingersoll, whose appearances celebrating the artistry of the legendary Judy Garland have received ovations across the country, both in her tribute concerts and appearing as Judy herself in the critically acclaimed play, End of the Rainbow. Hello, Angela. Hello, Michael. So nice to spend a holiday evening with you. Absolutely. <laughs> Premiering November 2nd, 1944, Meet Me in St. Louis, based on the stories of Sally Benson, is the deceptively simple story of the Smith family of St. Louis, Missouri, in the year leading up to the 1904 World's Fair, a production that became a landmark motion picture in the careers of star Judy Garland and director Vincent Minnelli, it remains one of the glittering jewels in the crown of Metro Goldwyn Mayer's very best musical films. So Angela, uh, there's so much to unpack about this film, but uh, of course at the center of all things Meet Me in St. Louis, it is Judy Garland. Uh, it is Judy, yeah. Yeah, let's talk a little bit about where was her career at the time that she got this project and began uh, filming it. What was going on with her, with Judy? She um, was quite on top as far as MGM was concerned, but personally she was feeling very rebellious. This was a time of her life that Judy no longer wanted to be seen as the, as the sweet little innocent that we were all so in love with. And uh, she was ready to take on more mature work, more dramatic work. And the minute this script came to her, she rejected it. She was appalled. She wanted to have nothing to do with it. She did not want to play a nice young lady in a nice young corset. Um, uh, she saw very little merit in the simplicity of the story. She, like many people around the studio, doubted it could be turned into a film at all because it seemed to have no plot. It seemed like nothing happened within the film, which of course it took a genius like Vincent Minnelli to show us the emotional journey, that how the drama is really something much more subtle yeah. in Meet Me in St. Louis. Uh, that was not Im immediately apparent to Judy, who threw a fit and wanted to have nothing to do with it, quite honestly. Uh, she was Metro's highest grossing star at this time, uh, having just come off of Girl Crazy. And um, she had a lot of fights in Girl Crazy, as we know, with, uh, with Busby Berkeley. And uh, she was uh, trying to make demands for herself for the first time. And it wasn't going very well with the studio. Mm -hmm. So the story that you mentioned, which seems to be about nothing, but is deeply about something, uh, was not originally conceived as a screenplay. This is from a, 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 a series of stories, right? By, by uh, author Sally Benson, correct? Right, she, uh, she had created a, a, a small serial that was appearing in New Yorker magazine, actually. Uh, folks would tune in weekly. Uh, I'm not sure if it was weekly or monthly, but regularly. I, I, I can say, to, to get a, a small piece of this family's Americana story. So much like Londoners couldn't wait to pick up the strand and see what Sherlock Holmes would do next, this was that kind of reading material uh, for Americans. And it wasn't until later, at, at the time it wasn't, it wasn't called Meet Me in St. Louis, St. Louis. I always say Meet Me in St. Louis. Right. I can't, I sing the song so much, I can't help <laughs> not calling it Meet Me in St. Louis. Uh, but the, the serial was actually, um, 5135 Kensington, as, as we know from the great lyrics of the song, The Boy Next Door, to be, uh, to be the home of the Smith family. Nice. Right there. Uh, so you mentioned earlier uh, uh, Vincent Minnelli. Of course, we know that last name very well. Uh, he was one of the great directors and also scenic designers and costume designers. Uh, well, where was Vincent Minnelli's career when he was given this assignment at Metro Goldwyn Mayer? He was the odd man on the lot. He was such an enigma. Uh, you know, uh, they they had no idea what to do with him. He had come from New York uh, as a great designer. Uh, if I may take a small detour before he was in New York. We know he was in Chicago. He spent about 10 years in Chicago, I think, dressing the windows at Marshall Fields, uh, you know, as a, as a designing artist who was meticulous, who knew how to tell a story by putting together all these tiny, tiny, very uh, luscious details of, 
uh, a storytelling within those picture windows. And I believe we get we get the full effect of that in Meet Me in St. Louis. So after Chicago went to New York and was quickly directing for Broadway um, and took his talents to Culver City there for MGM in, in Hollywood. And uh, he he was he was considered so strange. He was an effeminate man amongst business people. Um, his New York artistic ways, he would, he would f fly into a rehearsal full of purple eyeshadow and uh, no one quite knew how to interpret his very confident self-expression. He was a, a, a very, he was an artiste among a lot of people who were um, machines Mm -hmm. turning out movies as quickly as they could. And so he was a real breath of fresh air uh, in, in somebody like Judy's life once she got used to him. Mm -hmm. uh, he had just come off of directing Cabin in the Sky was the first project MGM gave to him. Mm -hmm. And he did sort of his um, Pygmalion Galatea thing there with uh, Lena Horne, which, which he'll later do with Judy. He took Lena Horne under her wing and really... Uh, both romantically and artistically helped her flourish in the world. And Cabin in the Sky is uh, was a project that was very low budget, that completely African-American cast and story that uh, wasn't supposed to be a hit and was absolutely phenomenal. Ethel Waters' performance, absolutely phenomenal. And so it, it was apparent very quickly that that this guy, Vincent, could turn just about anything into gold, even projects that seemed uh, risky. And so he was put with the script that seemed to be a story about nothing. And he absolutely saw beauty in it. His natural appreciation of his own feminine instincts helped him to see the, um, the very feminine qualities of the storytelling, the, the very emotional uh, interpersonal family politics that go on. And it wasn't flashy and it wasn't goofball and it wasn't like the Hardy Boys stories. It, it, was, it was a much more sensitive story. So he was the perfect person to convince the world that this was gonna be a great movie because nobody believed in it right. but him. And how did he and uh, Judy Garland get along? Were they good collaborators on this? Not at first, um, not at first. It's, 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 a, it's a complete 180 through the process. Um, she deeply resented him at first uh, because she was used to being such a perfectionist with her many, many years of vaudeville behind her and her many, many films behind her and her wonderful photographic memory. She was one take Judy. She could go into any scene and absolutely nail it in one or two takes. She could memorize every single spot she was supposed to hit, every light, and 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 she was perfection. Now it might take her two hours to come out of her dressing room before she would give you that performance because of her own uh, nerves, her reactions to her medications. Uh, but she was a great professional on the set for the way that MGM made movies, which was rather treating their stars like machines. So she meets Vincent and Vincent didn't like the first take and Vincent didn't like the second take. And Vincent would make her shoot over and over again until he could strip away from her the affectations of being a great performer who could nail it and revealed much more of the vulnerability that we've come to love from her. Yes, she's vulnerable as Dorothy. I won't say she's not there. And, and that's all wonderfully captured uh, in The Wizard of Oz. But she had kind of learned her shtick over the next couple of years, greatly influenced by Mickey Rooney, of course, how to do great shtick. Um, and, and by this point, she was a real craftsperson at that. And he, uh, Vincent, softened Judy into becoming an actress. Mm -hmm. um, at first, that was very difficult for her to accept. She was a vaudevillian. She would sell it. Now she was going to feel it in a completely new way for her, in a way that wasn't a little girl who was pleasing you, in a way that, who, that was a woman who was revealing herself to you. So this is where she realized, oh, this is the ticket to everything I've ever wanted. No longer will I be seen as a girl. I can be seen as a woman. 
If I learn this acting technique that he's talking to me about, showing my vulnerability, that's where all of my power is. And she begins to fall in love with Vincent after, after I might uh, mention she uh, had gone after Tom Drake, our, our leading man. She, <laughs> she, she tried with him for a minute. And uh, when, when that fizzled, she took it personally rather than realizing maybe it wasn't personal at all that he didn't have those kind of feelings for her. Uh, so when she put her trust in Vincent as a director that quickly developed into a romantic interest because she was so taken by someone who had the power to uh, help her see herself uh, finally as a woman, finally as someone who was beautiful. When she watched his rushes, she couldn't help the, the, you know, the, the reels at the end of the day. She couldn't help but notice he was a genius, all this meticulous detail. He made her look beautiful. He made her take the take until her hurt inside came out as beauty, mm -hmm. not as clinched pain, not as, a, 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 not as anger, uh, but as, a, 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 but as a, someone in true possession of, of a love for themselves. And that's not something Judy was brought up with. Right. Um, with the mother that she came up with. And so Vincent, I consider to be the real magician in Judy Garland's life because he taught her to find a real beauty in herself. And it was through the filming of this movie. So by the time we start filming uh, at the end of 1943, going into 1944, we were top of 1944, we're filming the movie. Um, she can't stand the Scots, beginnings of rehearsal. She's sick all the time. She calls in late all of the time. But by the time the movie has been uh, uh, released and it's New Year's Eve of 1944 going into 1945, she's giving him the midnight kiss at a party in Jack Benny's living room. Um, <laughs> she completely fell in love with him over that year uh, through the course of this picture. And it's so exciting to, to imagine that daily softening of her, uh, all of the defense mechanisms that she had built up in her hard-working years at MGM. So it's an incredibly important uh, film to her, not only professionally, but personally. And we're so excited to bring it to you uh, in its radio adaptation. So here on the December 2nd, 1946 episode of the Lux Radio Theater are Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake from the original film cast with Gail Gordon, uh, as Mr. Smith in Meet Me in St. Louis. Lux presents Hollywood. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company brings you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake in Meet Me in St. Louis. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. William Keeley. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. The theme song of tonight's play is the title of Metro Golden Mare's screen hit, Meet Me in St. Louis, based on the novel of the same name by Sally Benson, currently playing in theaters all over the country. The title refers, of course, to the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904. Ten million people attended it, but twice as many people in our listening audience will be going there tonight with three of Hollywood's most charming stars, Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake. They take you back to an era of nostalgic charm in a warm and haunting story of romance. And in that same nostalgic spirit, comes a letter from a young girl who was married last September in a family heirloom dress of Maltese lace. The lace, she says, was very delicate and 97 years old. Yet when we washed it with Lux Flakes just before the wedding, it came out perfectly preserved in color, daintiness, and texture. We were astonished that a lace so old and delicate could be so beautifully restored. To Mrs. T.A. Gunderson, the bride, our heartiest thanks and our sincere best wishes for a happy future with Lux Flakes. On to act one of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland as Esther, Margaret O'Brien as Tootie, and Tom Drake as John, with Gail Gordon as Alonzo. <laughs> In 
In the year 1903, there lived in the city of St. Louis a family named Smith. There were Mr. and Mrs. Alonzo Smith and Grandpa Smith. There were also two daughters and a son, Rose, Esther, and Lonnie. Oh, yes, and another daughter, Tutti, aged seven, who at this moment perches next to Mr. Costello on Mr. Costello's ice wagon. My goodness, Tutti, at five o'clock. Giddy up, be dressed. Oh, how's your doll feeling now, Tutti? Any better? Oh, no. Poor Margaretha. I've never seen her look so pale. Mm, probably the heat. Been awful hot today. I doubt very much if Margaretha will live through the night. She has four fatal diseases. Mm, as rule, only takes one. She's going to have a beautiful funeral in a cigar box my papa gave me, all wrapped up in silver paper. Mm, that's the way to go if you got to go. Oh, she's got to go. How's Beatrice feeling? Oh, Beatrice don't mind the heat. Why, she's the strongest horse in St. Louis. Excuse me, Mr. Costello, but it's pronounced St. Louis. Mm, that's funny. Now you take that their new song. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis, meet me. Oh, well, that's different. We sing that song all the time in our house. My sister Esther and my sister Rose and Grandpa and everybody. Well, St. Louis, St. Louis, it's still a grand old town. It's not a town, Mr. Costello. It's a city, and it's the only city that's going to have a World's Fair. Gosh, wasn't I lucky to be born in my favorite city? You sure were, honey. So was I, and so was Beatrice. Is that right, Beatrice? Come on, gal. Get up. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis. Meet me at the fair. Don't tell me the lights are shining any place but there. We will dance the hoochie coochie. You will be my tootsie wootsie if you will meet me in St. Louis, Louis. Meet me at the fair. Come on, Rose, and sing. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis. Meet me at the fair. Don't tell me the lights are shining. Hey, oh, hello, Papa. Did you just come home, Papa? The fair won't open for months, but that's all everybody talks about or sings about. Where's Mama? Here I am, dear. Well, did you have a nice day, Alonzo? I had a terrible day, Anna. I lost the case. Oh, dear. Oh, well, Papa, if losing a case depresses you so, why don't you give up law and go into some other business? All right, Esther, I will. Beginning tomorrow, I intend to play first base for the Baltimore Orioles. Right now, I'm going to soak in a cool bath for one solid hour. Oh, but that's impossible, Papa. Katie's serving dinner in five minutes. Five minutes? Alonzo, we, we planned on eating an hour earlier tonight. I'm taking a bath! Oh, Rose, dear, I'm so oh, sorry. But it's nothing to upset the entire household about. Warren Sheffield, a Yale man, is going to telephone you at 6.30, and you say it's nothing. Rose, the telephone's in the dining room. You certainly don't want the whole family sitting there drinking in every word when a man proposes long distance. I don't see why you assume Warren is going to propose to me. He's calling from New York. Do you know what that costs? Now, I think that's just about enough of this. Now, where's Tootie? Oh, she's delivering ice with Mr. Costello. No, she came back a few minutes ago. She's in the backyard burying her doll. Well, call her in to see that she gets washed. And Lonnie. Lonnie! Now, don't you worry, Rose, dear. Everything will work out all right. Mama, it's 6.30 and Papa isn't down yet. He will be. Tootie! Grandpa! Lonnie, come on, dinner! Has he telephoned yet, Rose? Grandpa, I'm not in the least concerned whether Mr. Sheffield calls or not. I suppose Warren's too young, huh? Every fellow I introduce her to is too young. Now, listen, children. Your father will be right down. If we eat dinner quickly, we may be finished by the time... Oh, 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 now I remember. Now I remember where I left my other roller skate. On the staircase. I hope I haven't held you up. I was just taking a little ride before dinner. <laughs> Tootie, is this your roller skate? Yes, Papa. And thank you. You're welcome. And remind me to spank you after dinner. Yes, Papa. Ah, soup. Don't blame me if it's cold, Mr. Smith. Oh, Katie. So is the corned beef. No, no, no. It's fine. Delicious. Well, what's the matter with everybody? Eat your soup. Oh, 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 oh Rose, let me get it. Yes, telephone, yes, telephone. What are you all quiet. jumping for? Sit still. I'll answer it. I'll die. I'll simply die. Hello? What? New York? No, I'm not calling New York. What? Hello? 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 Anna? 
I'm going to have that instrument of torture ripped out of this home. Oh, Alonzo, every telephone call's not for you, dear. Rose is crying. Well, what's the matter with you? <laughs> oh, it's nothing, Papa. You've just ruined Rose's chances to get married, that's all. What did you say? That was Warren Sheffield calling long distance to propose. Oh, I see. Tootie, did you know there was a long distance call coming to this house? You know what, Papa? The ice man saw a drunk who get shot yesterday and blood spurted out three feet Answer and... Answer yes or no. Yes. Lon, Grandpa, Anna, well... And just when was I voted out of this family? Oh, Alonzo, really now? My eldest daughter is practically on her honeymoon, and everybody in St. Louis knows about it but me. Well, from now on, I'll handle all telephone calls to this house. But, Papa! Nobody answers the phone but me. But I. Thank you. Rose, answer the telephone. <laughs> Thank you, Papa. Hello, Warren? How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Rose. How St. Louis? What did you say? I said, how St. Louis? Oh, it's fine. Uh, fine. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, yes, I can hear you the fine. The whole neighborhood can hear you. Well, uh... What did you say, Warren? Nothing, uh, nothing. I was waiting for you to say something. Oh. Uh, Rose, I... I hope you won't misunderstand what I'm going to tell you. Yes? Well, I... I don't think you should mention this call to your family. Why not? Well, because there'd be H to pay if my family ever found out I called you long distance. Oh, oh he said there'd be H. Well, my family's here, and they don't think anything of it. Well, I'd better not waste any more of your time or money. Rose, I've still got 35 Never seconds. Never mind. Well, Rose, I'll, I'll write to you as soon as I hang up. Well, that'll be very nice. Goodbye, Warren. Well, that's the darndest proposal I ever heard. Oh, well, of all things, he talked about the weather. Well, I bet there isn't another girl in St. Louis who's had a Yale man call her long distance just to inquire about her health. If, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to be excused. A Yale man, eh, Lonnie? Yes, Papa. That settles it. You're going to Princeton. It's nice just sitting on the front porch, isn't it, Rose? I just love a summer night. Esther wasn't that silly of me running away from the dinner table. Oh, Rose, I wish I had your, your savoir faire. Esther, look. Hmm? Next door, a new neighbor. John Truitt. He's on the lawn. Now, for goodness sakes, don't let on that we see him. Ready? Yes. Let's, let, let, let's get a little closer to the railing. Isn't it a gorgeous night, Esther, dear? Heavenly, Rose, just heavenly. He smokes a pipe. I understand they're having a fashion pavilion at the fair. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> I shan't be at all surprised if Joe insists on taking me to the fair every single night. Joe's so overpowering. Oh, prunes. Uh huh? Well, look, he just walked back into his house. Oh. He's not very neighborly, I must say. Well, he's only lived here two weeks. You can't expect him to fling himself at you. How am I going to meet him? I know. I'll get George Briggs to bring him over here to Lon's going away party. Oh, Rose, could you? Of course. Let me get some stationery. We can write the invitations right now, tonight. He didn't even notice me. What if he can't come to our party? What if he's got a girl? The moment I saw him smile, I... He was just my style My only regret Is we've never met Though I dream of him all the while But he doesn't know I exist No matter how I may persist So clear to see there's no hope for me though i live at 5135 kensington avenue and he lives at 5133 how can i ignore the boy next door i love him more than i doesn't try to please me, doesn't even tease me, 
and he never sees me glance his way. And though I'm heart sore, the boy next door, affection for me won't display. I just adore him. So I can't ignore him, the boy next door. My dear Mr. Truitt, you are cordially invited to a party on Saturday next in honor of our brother, Alonzo Smith, Jr., who is living for Princeton. Cordially yours, Rose Smith. How's that, Es? Well, it's pretty formal, but I guess we'd be, better be pretty formal to start with. John, huh? Oh, Princeton's a peach of a school. A peach of a school. Well, that's where I'm going. I... Oh, Esther. Yes, Alonzo? Uh, may I present our neighbor, John Truitt? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the name. John Truitt. Oh, <laughs> well, welcome to our house, Mr. Truitt. Well, thank you. You know, this is the first party I've been invited to since we moved to St. Louis. Oh, do you live here? Well, of course he lives here, right next door. Oh, well, that's where I've seen you. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> if this dance isn't taken, Miss Smith, I'd be very honored. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, but I... Oh, well, since you're our next door neighbor. Thank you. Oh, Miss Esther. Uh, yes, Mr. Truitt. There's a mouse in the house. Hmm? Look, on the hall stairs. Why, Tootie Smith, why aren't you asleep? There was too much noise down here. Noise? We've just been dancing and singing. I want to sing, too. Oh, oh, come on. Oh, oh, oh. Well, all right, just one song. Now, what would you like to sing, darling? Baby's Boat? Or did you ever see a rabbit climb a tree? Or... Oh, I hate those songs. I want to sing a new one. I was, hmm, last night, dear mother. <laughs> well, you can't sing that. Oh, do let her. She's such a sweet little thing. Sweet? She's a little hoodlum. Oh, 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 oh well, all right. Go ahead, Tootie. I was drunk last night, dear mother. I was drunk the night before. But if you'll forgive me, mother, I'll never get drunk anymore. <laughs> Tootie, you're a very bad little girl. <laughs> it's really Lon's fault, Mr. Truett. He teaches her those things. Now, Tootie, you scoot right up to bed this instant. Uh, Rose, oh, Rose, dear, might we have some dance music, please? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Looks like I'm the last one leaving. Uh, well, uh, good night, Miss Esther. Uh, good night. Yes, oh, don't forget your beauty, please. Presently, Rose, dear. Well, I guess I'd better get going. Uh, well, uh, we'll be seeing some more of you, won't we? Oh, you bet. You, you'll be joining our crowd Friday. We're all taking the trolley out to the fairgrounds just to see what progress they're making. Oh, sure, sure. Well... Good night. Good night. Oh, uh, that Welch rabbit you served was ginger peachy. Oh, well, I'm, I'm so glad. Oh, uh, Mr. Truitt. Uh, yes, Miss Esther? Uh, this is a, an untoward request, but would you mind accompanying me through the house while I turn out the lights? Well, I... It's just that I, uh, uh I'm afraid of mice. <laughs> well, sure, sure. That's the least a man can do for his charming host. Those two lights in the hall, and then we'll be finished. Oh, if you can't see, just take my hand, Mr. Truitt. Well, uh, thanks. This way. Say, uh, mm, that's nice perfume. 
Do you like it? It's essence of violet. Uh, exactly the same kind my grandmother uses. Uh, no, this is different. <laughs> well, here's the hall. Uh, hadn't we better save those lights for your folks? Well, I'll just turn them down dim. There. My, it's certainly dark in here with the lights off, isn't it? <sighs> Gosh, Miss Esther, I hope I'm not too presumptuous, but you don't need any beauty sleep. Oh, what a nice thing to say. Oh, this has been a great evening. I'll never forget it. Do you mean that? Yes, yes, I do. Do you always shake hands with the girl when you say goodnight? Oh, no, no, sir. Only when I... Well, when I think an awful lot of her. Oh. A and you know something else, Esther? What? You've got a mighty strong grip for a girl. <laughs> Good night, Esther. Good night, neighbor. Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake will return for Act Two of Meet Me in St. Louis in a moment. Say, Libby, a boy wants to know whether his girl will like him better if he becomes a great dancer like Fred Astaire or a famous crooner like Bing Crosby. Well, why not tell him to see Paramount's new picture, Blue Skies? They're both in that, and they both love the same girl, Joan Caulfield. Frankly, if I'd been Joan in that picture, I never could have made up my mind. Those wonderful sentimental tunes Bing sings should sweep any girl off her feet. Mm, just like in a stair dance. Isn't this Fred's farewell to pictures? Well, that's what he insists, but millions hope it isn't true. He's never been better or his dance is more original. Being Astaire's partner is a real honor. Well, he has two in Blue Skies. Blonde Joan Caulfield and a little Latin from Manhattan, Olga San Juan. Both are divine in technicolor. I'll bet I know another thing they had in common. What's that? Lux care for their stockings. Oh, you're absolutely right. Anybody who dances knows how much strain stockings get. So naturally, the girls use Lux flakes to cut down runs. Not only girls who dance, Libby, but girls everywhere know how much longer Lux stockings last. And so do Paramount Studios. Stockings for the chorus got the same Lux care as those of the stars. But, of course, Joan knew about Lux long before she went to Hollywood. Wasn't she a model in New York? That's right. And models soon learned to get more wear from stockings by luxing them every night. Well, actual strain tests proved how right they are. In these tests, stockings rubbed with cake soap went into runs very quickly. The luxed ones lasted and lasted. Twice as long, in fact. Girls on a budget appreciate that. Right, Libby. Now, a suggestion to the ladies of our audience. Because Lux is made of scarce materials, please don't waste it. Here's your producer, William Keeley. Act two of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland as Esther, Margaret O'Brien as Tootie, and Tom Drake as John. <laughs> Well, Friday's come, and with it, the trolley ride to the fairgrounds. Now take a trolley, fill it with boys and girls, and sooner or later, somebody's singing. In this instance, it's Miss Hester Smith, who finds ample reason to sing, for sitting next to her, thoroughly smitten, is the boy next door, John Truitt. With my high starch collar and my high top shoes and my hair piled high upon my head, I went to lose a jolly hour on the trolley and lost my heart instead. With his light brown derby and his bright green tie, he was quite the handsomest of men. I started to yen, so I counted to ten, then I counted to ten again. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. Zing, zing, zing went my heartstrings. From the moment I saw him, I fell. Chug, chug, chug went the motor. Bump, bump, bump went the brake. Thump, thump, thump went my heartstrings. When he smiled, I could feel the car shake. Clang, clang. 
He tipped his hat and took a seat. He said he hoped he hadn't stepped upon my feet. He asked my name, I held my breath. I couldn't speak because he scared me half to death. Buzz, buzz, buzz went the buzzer. Plop, plop, plop went the wheels. Stop, stop, stop went my heartstrings. As he started to go, then I started to know how it feels. When the universe reels The day was bright, the air was sweet The smell of honeysuckle charmed her off her feet She tried to sing but couldn't speak In fact she loved him so she couldn't even speak Buzz, buzz, buzz went the buzzer Plop, plop, plop went the wheels Stop, stop, stop went my heartstrings as he started to leave, I took hold of his sleeve with my hand. And as if it were planned, he stayed on with me, and it was grand just to stand with his hand holding mine till the end of the It's a few weeks later now, Halloween, and at the Smith home, disguised in sagging pants, a long red nose, and bristling mustaches, Miss Tootie Smith is about to brave the thrills and terrors of this ghost-ridden night. And wait you see what I do to Mr. Bruckhoff. Do you know what Mr. Bruckhoff does, Esther? Minds his own business, as far as I know. He buys meat and poison, and then he puts it all together and kills cats, Thousands of cats. And when he's not killing cats, he beats his wife with a red-hot poker. My goodness. Glennie Travis told me. Are you going out with Glennie and the rest of those ragamuffins? They're all down at the corner. They got a big red bonfire. That's so the banshees will know where to come. And I'm going to oh. go and... Oh, dear. Oh, oh don't my. be afraid, Mama. It's only me. Oh, Oh, why, I thought some horrible ghost had come into the house. Oh, I'm horrible, all right. I was murdered last week in a den of thieves. <gasps> Here it is, Judy. Here's oh. your flower. Thanks, Grandpa. You wouldn't catch me out on a night like this for a million dollars. Why not? Too many terrible spirits roaming around. Grandpa. Oh, go on, Tootie. It's Halloween. I just hope I get back to my bed and board all right. If you wet the flower before you throw it, it's harder for the victims to get it off. Well, goodbye. Goodbye, everybody. Well, all right, everybody, I guess we're all ready to yeah. go. Yeah. I'm ready, Glenn. Me too. Mrs. Wilkins said she'd leave her hammock on the front porch. And would the children please bring it back after they're through stealing it? Maybe we will and maybe we won't. Anyway, you ain't coming. Why not? Because you're too little, Tootie. Hey, who's going to take the Brokoff's house? Not me. Mr. Brokoff's got a great big beard. And a great big bulldog. And he poisons cats and beats oh, his wife. Oh, Tootie, why don't you go home? Well, somebody's got to take the Brokoff's. I'll take him. I'll take the Brokoff's. Oh, oh boy, Dad, I don't need to go on home oh, oh, till you grow up. I won't go home. I won't. I'm going to take the Brokoff's. I'll torture him good and pull their roof down. Well, you got some flour? Yes. Just remember, if you don't hit Mr. Brockhoff in the face with a flower and say, I hate you, the Banshees will haunt you forever. They will? Well, what did you think? Well, here I go. And come back when your mission is over. We'll be meeting here around the fiery furnace. Oh, Lordy, I sure wish Esther was here. I can't do it. I can't. I'm too scared. Well, what do you want? Don't try to run away. Yes, Mr. Brockoff. Did you ring my doorbell, ghost? Yes, sir. Well, go on. Throw the flower on me. Oh, all right. Some more. On my beard. Yes, sir. Now say it. Say it. I, I hate you, Mr. Brockoff. That's fine, Tootie. Good night, dear. <laughs> I'm the most horrible. I'm the most horrible of everybody. Is that you, Judy? I'm coming. Well, did you have a nice... 
Grandpa Glennie. Esther, you better come quick. Something happened to Tootie. What are you talking about? Down by the trolley. She got hurt, Esther. She's bleeding like anything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Esther, did you get Pop on the telephone? No, Mama, they said he just left. It's Tootie's lip, Mama. It's all cut. Oh, good heavens. And a tooth knocked out. Oh, Katie, another compress. There, there, darling. Everything's going to be fine. He tried to kill me. Why, Tootie. She must mean the streetcar. I think it hit her. It wasn't the streetcar. It, it was John Truitt. Oh, John no. Truitt? John Truitt? He was going to kill me. That's how I got hurt. When I screamed, he ran away. What? Tootie Smith, that's a monstrous falsehood. Now, wait a minute, Tootie. What's that in your hand? Why, why, it's some strands of hair. Yes, and I don't think it's Tootie's. I yanked it out of his head. He tried to kill me. Brown hair. John Truitt has brown hair. Excuse me. Oh, is that you, Esther? Oh, hello, Esther. John Truitt. Yes? Hey, wait a minute. I've come here to ask you something. Hey, cut it out, Esther. The next time you put hey, on, cut somebody, it out. Pick on somebody your own size, what do you mean hitting a seven-year-old child? Esther. If there's anything I hate, loathe, despise, and abominate, it's a bully. <laughs> I want to sleep in Esther's bed, Mama. Of course, darling. Oh, I hate to think what your father's going to say when he hears about this. He may even strike that Truett boy. He won't have to, Mama. I just took care of him. I was drunk last night, dear Mother. I was drunk the night before. Esther, your dress. Oh, that must have happened when he was trying to hold me off. I bit him. I bit him, too. Did you, Tootie? That's not what Tommy Berkheimer says. I've just been talking to him. Did the trolley go off the gra tracks, Grandpa? No, but the cable came off when the motorman put on the brakes so fast. At least that's what Tommy tells me. What are you talking about? It seems the kids had found an old suit of clothes, so they stuffed it with straw, and somebody put it on the trolley tracks. We thought the car would go off the tracks. Tootie Smith, why, you're nothing less than a murderess. You might have killed dozens of people. Oh, Rose, you're so stuck up. Tootie, how did you get that lip? How? Because John Truett butted in. He dragged me up an alley so the policeman wouldn't get me. Huh. As though policemen never pay attention to girls. But I yanked his hair out and got away. Then I fell down and cut my lip. Oh, what I'm going to do to you. Oh, yes, leave her alone. <laughs> well, what's so funny? Tootie, honestly, you're the most deceitful, sinful little creature I've ever seen. And for two cents, I'd... <laughs> Merciful heavens. John... Oh, no, Esther, not again, please. Oh, John, John, there's been a terrible mistake. There has? Oh, yes, you see, I... Oh, did I do that? Black eye, and this, and this, and this. Oh, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, that's all right. How's Tootie? <laughs> oh, she'll live. <laughs> oh, John, it's, it's awfully nice of you to accept my apology. Well, if you're not busy tomorrow night, could you beat me up again? <laughs> Yeah, well, I guess I better be getting home. Oh, uh, before you go, would you mind helping me turn out the lights? I'm afraid of mice. <laughs> Looks like most of the lights are out. Wouldn't take a minute to turn them on again. Well, wouldn't that be kind of wasting a minute? Yeah. Yeah, I guess it would, Esther. You know, you've got a mighty strong grip for a boy. If I ever catch you fibbing again, Tootie, I'll give you something that you'll... Oh, Esther, dear, I hope... Why, Esther, is there something wrong? Yes, Mama. Roses are red and John's name is Tootie. Esther's in love, and we always knew oh, it. Mama, can't you make Tootie stop? Is this where the Smith family lives? Why, hello. Come on in. Hello. Oh, home, Papa. I almost got killed. We stopped the trolley, and I lost my tooth, and Esther bit John Truett. And Anna, Tootie Anna. fell, dear, and cut her lip. She's fine. Oh, that's a brave little girl, Tootie. Oh, uh, Anna, for you. Why, Alonzo, what a lovely box of candy. 
Is anything wrong? Anna, the firm is sending me to New York. Well, that's lovely, dear. Just as long as you'll be home for Thanksgiving. No, you don't understand. I'm to head the office there. We're moving to New York. Moving? To New York? Well, I don't believe it. Well, I simply don't believe it. Why, Anna, I thought you'd be overjoyed. But New York is such a big city, and, well, what'll the children do? The same as they do here. Go to school, play, have their friends over. What friends, Alonzo? Yes, what friends? The friends they'll meet in New York. And Tootie just ready to be promoted. And Esther a senior. I've worked all my life to be a senior. And Rose in the Conservatory of Music. Yes, what about me in my life? You can take that with you. It's settled. We're going. Well, I must say you're being very cold-blooded. Well, I've got our future to think about. I've got to worry about where the money's coming from. With Lon in Princeton and Rose in music school and Tootie... Money. I hate, loathe, despise and abominate money. You also spend it. And what about Katie and Grandpa and the chickens? Not that we have many left. That's a minor detail we can discuss later. So I'm a minor detail, am I? You know very well, Papa, I was talking about the chickens. Oh, never mind what happens to your family, as long as the chickens are provided for. Now, 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 I guess we're all a little excited. We'll talk this over calmly tomorrow. Well, what's this? Hickory nut cake, as only Katie can make it. Oh, I can't go to New York. I simply can't. I'm taking my cat. Winona goes wherever I go. Well, you keep her cooped up in a tenement. Oh, good evening, Katie. Couldn't help overhearing. Don't they have houses in New York? Rich people have houses. People like us live in flats. Thousands of people in one building. And what about the World's Fair? Yes, just when St. Louis is going to be the center of, of attraction of the entire universe. Katie, this cake is as light as a feather. You can bake anything in our stove. They got little box stoves in them tenements. <clears throat> uh, pass your plates, everybody. Have some cake. Thanks. I guess I got some things to do. Excuse me. Oh, you going up too, Grandpa? I, uh, I'll help Katie with the ice cream dishes, Mom. Me too. As long as we're moving, it won't matter if I break some. <sighs> Aren't you afraid, Anna? Alone in this room with a, a criminal? Now, dear, if you think it's best to move to New York, why, why that's what we'll do. Eat your cake, Alonzo. Ah, it's good to hear you play, Anna. My, that's a nice song. Remember when I used to sing it? Yes. <clears throat> of dark and fair weather You and I Papa, that's... That's just lovely. Tootie and I... Well, I, I guess we'll have some cake after all. I want the piece with the rose petals. Mighty nice song. Mighty nice. Rose and I... Well, there's nothing like good music in a piece of hickory cake. No, sir. <laughs> and you know, I'll bet New York is, is going to be just... just fine. Hi, this is Porchlight Casting and Company Manager Christopher Pazdernick. Thank you for listening to WPMT. If you value programming like this, please consider making a donation today at porchlightmusictheater.org. We appreciate your consideration and hope you enjoy the show. Act three of Meet Me in St. Louis, starring Judy Garland as Esther, Margaret O'Brien as Tootie, and Tom Drake as John. It's the day before Christmas, a week before the family moves to New York, and five hours before the annual Christmas ball at the Women's Club. And Alonzo Smith, Jr., home from Princeton for the holidays, has a problem. Oh, Lonnie, you needn't be so grouchy just because Lucille Ballard doesn't think you're good enough to take her to the dance tonight. A girl has a right to go to a dance with anyone she wants. I, I just didn't ask her soon enough. Everyone knows Miss Ballard is just an Eastern snob. Well, you're in a fine mood. All because Warren Sheffield asked her instead of you. That's not true. 
Rose could have had any man she wanted. Except Warren Sheffield. Everyone knows that Lucille Ballard is just throwing herself at Warren because of his father's money. Now, that's what I call real Christmas spirit. Now, just a minute, Katie. Didn't it ever occur to you that you might take your sister to the dance? My own brother? I'd be the laughing stock of St. Louis. Well, thank you. Oh, Katie's absolutely right. Oh, Lon, it's our last dance in St. Louis, and it'd be tragic if either of you missed it's it. It's all right for you to talk. You have a date, a real one. Well, Rose, if I didn't have a date with John Truett, which I have, I'd be thrilled to go with my own brother. Well, I'd be willing, Rose. I mean, I'd be glad to. You would? <laughs> Why, you two will have the best time of anybody. You won't even have to be polite to each other. Now, hurry, yes, it's half past seven. Oh, oh yes, you look grand, oh. simply grand. That oh. corset makes your figure just elegant. Oh, I feel elegant. But I can't breathe. But if we're going to wreck Lucille Ballard's evening, we definitely need every ounce of allure. Oh, Rose, don't you think I could be alluring without a corset? No, Esther, I don't. After all, you're competing with an Eastern girl. We'll have to monopolize all the worthwhile men. <sighs> well, there'll only be about 20 boys worth looking at. We could certainly handle 20 men. But what about John Truett? Oh, I'll devote myself to John. But in between times, I'm going to make my presence felt amongst the others. Oh, Esther. What is it, Tootie? Somebody at the back door to see you. Who? <laughs> Gosh, do you look funny. Oh, Tootie. Rose, could I please wear a corset, now, too? Tootie. Who's at the back door? Oh, somebody that looks like John Truett. Oh, oh, Rose, give me my kimono. I wonder what he could want. What are you giving me for Christmas, Rose? Well, you'll find out tomorrow. I certainly hope it's a hunting night. Nothing I need worse than a good hunting night. But, John, well, come on in. Yes, I've got some bad news. My, my tuxedo. Well, what about it? It's at the tailor's. You see, I was playing basketball, and when I got there, it was closed. But can't you borrow one? I've tried, but everybody who's got one is going to the ball. What about your father's? That was my father's. Well, then find the tailor and make him open the shop. Well, I know his name is Johnson, but I don't know where he lives. Oh. Oh, this is simply ghastly. Oh, yes, I wouldn't blame you if you never spoke to me again. Oh, well, you, you didn't do it on purpose. I guess there's nothing else I can say, unless you want to do something else tonight. No, I, I better just stay home and do some packing. You know, we're leaving St. Louis in a few days. I know. And this is a fine going away present I'm giving you. I'll bet you really hate me. Oh, no, John, I don't hate you. I just hate basketball. It's simply awful, Esther. I wish I were dead, that's all. Well, there's only one thing to do. Lon will have to take both of us. You don't think I'm going to the smartest ball of the season with my own brother, do well, you? I like that. You wanted me to go with him. You didn't have a date. But I can't handle 20 men alone. I admit it. Did you ever stop to think of what people would come say? In. Come in, Grandpa. You know, the man who built this house cheated your father. The walls are thin as paper. Oh, Grandpa. Now, now, now. <laughs> Esther, it's a funny thing. I took my tuxedo out of the moth ball only yesterday. Looked pretty good, too. That suit of mine does the greatest one step you ever saw. Grandpa, are you actually... Yes, what's this toot he says about you're not going to the dance? Who says I'm not going? Of course I'm going. With the handsomest man in town. Madame, I'll pick you up at eight. Esther, Esther, I'm here. I John. made it. Oh, gosh, yes. I didn't find Mr. Johnson until 20 minutes at 10. But he opened up the shop, and well, here I am. Oh, John, so much has happened, and I'm so glad. And if I'm crying, it's just because everything's turned out so simply divinely, and it's Christmas almost, and... I... But what's happened? No, don't you see them dancing? Rose and Warren Sheffield. Miss Ballard's a simply charming girl, even if she is an Easterner. She said we're all grown up, aren't we? And since all Warren talks about is Rose, my goodness, why doesn't he fill her dance card? Who's Lucille dancing with? Oh, Lonnie, of course. Oh, she's terribly fond of him. It's really so obvious. And now you're here. Oh, John, I've never been so happy in my life. Esther... Could we... 
could we go outside for a minute? I want to talk to you. Well, of course, John, if you'd like. Oh, I wouldn't have said it, Esther, if I thought it would make you cry again. Uh, are you sure you're warm enough? Uh -huh. Oh, I've imagined you saying it thousands of times that I always planned exactly how I'd act. I never planned to cry. Well, at least you didn't laugh. Laugh? I guess I never asked a girl to marry me before. I guess maybe I was kind of... Oh, well... John, no one could have done it more beautifully... I'm very proud. Esther, will you? Oh, will you, Esther? Of course I will, John. Oh, gosh. Do you realize I might have lost you? A few more days and you'd have been gone. We might never have seen each other again. And now we're engaged. Esther, let's go home and tell your folks right now. Oh, no, uh, not tonight. I, I'd, I'd rather just the two of us knew about it tonight. Now, we're not going to let them talk us out of it. After all, we are of age. Well, practically. John, even, even if I it did go to New York, we, we could still work something out. Somehow. Couldn't we, John? Merry Christmas, John. Merry Christmas, Esther. with you, Esther? Of course, darling. Come on now, cover up. You weren't asleep either, were you? Mm -mm. I've just been lying here, thinking. Was the dancing nice? Wonderful. I've been watching the moon so bright, but I haven't seen anything. Did he come? Did who come? Santa Claus. <laughs> now you know he's not going to come until you're fast asleep. Then sing to me, Esther. Sing to me till I'm asleep. All right. What kind of song, darling? A Christmas song. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Let your heart be light. Next year all our troubles will be out of sight. A merry little Christmas Make the Yuletide gay Next year all our troubles Will be miles away Once again as in olden days Happy golden days of your faithful friends who were dear to us will be near to us once more. Someday soon we all will be together if the fates until then, we'll have to muddle through somehow. So have yourself a merry little Christmas now. You're still awake. I can't go to sleep. I can't. Oh, Esther, how will Santa Claus know where to find us next year? We'll be in New York. Oh, you can't fool him. He can find anybody he wants to find. If he brings me any toys, I'm taking them with me. I'm taking my dolls and the dead ones, too. I'm taking everything. Of course you are. You won't have to leave anything behind. 
Except your snowman, of course. My snowman? Well, we, we'd look pretty silly trying to get the snowman on the train now, wouldn't we? Snowman, my snowman. Tootie, come back here. My poor little snowman. What's going to happen to them? Snowman, snowman. Tootie, darling, it's, it's all right. It's all right. But what on earth happened, Esther? What was Tootie doing in the backyard? She just ran out, Papa, and it started to smash all her snowmen. Nobody's going to have my snowmen. Not if we're moving to New York. Oh, don't cry, darling. You can build other snowmen in New York. No, you can't. You can't do anything in New York like you can in St. Louis. You sure she'll be all right? Yes, Papa, you go back to bed. I'll take care of her. Well, good night, Esther. Good, good night. Tootie, darling, New York's a wonderful place. Wait till you see the fine home we're going to have and the friends we're going to make. But the main thing, Tootie, is we're all going to be together, just like we've always been. That's what really counts. We could be happy anywhere as long as we're together. Anna, Anna, wake up. Rose, Grandpa, Lonnie. Everybody, get up. Oh, Esther, Tootie, come on, all of you. Come on downstairs. Uh, Papa, Papa, what's wrong? Everything's wrong. Anna, where are you? Where Grandpa, are come you? downstairs this minute. Now, everybody get in here and sit down. There's nothing to sit on, Alonzo. Oh. Nothing but packing boxes. Then come into the dining room. I've got a few words to say to this family. Well, what is it, for heaven's sake? Well, we are not moving to New York. Oh, oh. And I don't want to hear a word about it. We're going to stay right here in St. Louis till we rot. We haven't rotted yet, Alonzo. Oh, but what'll you say to the firm, Papa, to Mr. Fenton? That I've changed my mind. I'm a junior partner, not a puppet on a string. But New York, Alonzo, you, you did think it was a fine opportunity, didn't you? Well, I, I was looking forward to going, yes. But after all these weeks, watching my family's hearts breaking, and, and then Tootie a little while ago, and... <laughs> well, New York hasn't got a copyright on opportunity. The trouble with you people is you don't appreciate St. Louis because it's right here under your noses. I'll take that. Oh! Is this you, Rose? Oh, I mean... Do I sound like Rose? Well, then get into the phone. Wake her up or something. Now, just a minute, young man. Who do you think you're Papa, talking to? Papa, Papa, I... please let me take it. Hello? Rose Smith, I haven't slept a wink since I took you home from the dance, and I won't go on like this any longer. Warren. We're going to get married, and I don't want to hear any arguments. Now, that's final. Oh! I love you. Warren, but... Uh, Warren. Anna, who is that boy? Do you know? Alonzo, he's a very fine young man. Now, we'll talk about it later. Oh, Rose, darling, you handle the whole thing magnificently. He's just putty in your hands. <sighs> well, I hope you'll be very happy, Rose. And sometime, if you can arrange it, I'd like to meet that young oh, fellow. Papa, Mama. If Rose is going to get married, maybe we had a better open up her Christmas presents now. <laughs> oh, you little faker. It's your presents you're after. <laughs> He's been here. Santa Claus. Well, of course, in the living room. Oh, good heavens. It's Christmas morning. <laughs> oh, Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Papa, you've given us the nicest Christmas anybody could ask for. We're staying in St. Louis. Good morning, Mr. Costello. Good morning, Tootie. Gonna help me deliver ice today? Today? Do you know what today is? Sure do. First day of May, 1904. It's fair day, Mr. Costello. Today's the day the World's Fair opens. My family's going, and Papa says we're not coming home till they throw us out. Is that a fact? Well, gee up, me dress. But don't you worry. I'll help you deliver ice tomorrow. <laughs> Oh, John, it's 8 o'clock. We promised to meet the family for dinner at the French Pavilion. Oh, we'll be there, Esther. I just didn't want you to miss this. Miss what, John? The electric lights. Look, Es, they're turning them on. Oh. Here they come. Oh. Oh. John, it, it's, it's just breathtaking. I never dreamed anything could be so beautiful. Imagine there's never been anything like this in the whole world. That's right, Es. There's nothing like this. And no one like you. Just think of all the things we'll have to tell our kids someday. I wonder if they'll believe it, John. I can hardly believe it myself. You and, and a World's Fair right here where we live. Right here in St. Louis.
Before our stars return to the microphone, I'd like to tell you about Mrs. Brown. The Browns had some friends in for dinner recently, and after they finished, Mrs. Green said... Let's do the dishes now, Mary. I'll give you a hand. Oh, thanks. It really won't take long. Optimus. But I always say you can talk just as well in the kitchen as anywhere. Want me to wash? Oh, no. That's the easiest part. Who do you think you're kidding? Look at these dishpan hands of mine. Oh, I have Lux. You have? Where'd you get it? Down at the corner. Some came in while I was there the other day. Lucky. I haven't been able to get any lately. Mm, I guess you've just struck it wrong. We're all so sick of those strong soaps that Lux goes like hotcakes. Do strong soaps bother your hands, too? Do they? Why, mine looked worse than yours. But soon as I switched to Lux, they started getting better. Note that, Mrs. Green. Tests prove changing to Lux Flakes does just what Mrs. Brown says. It takes away that ugly dishpan redness. You'll begin to notice improvement in just a few days. Another thing, you have to use so much of that strong soap to get suds. I know. But you saw how little Lux Flakes I put in the dishpan. And look what rich suds they make. Those richer suds will actually go further, Mrs. Green. Do you know that ounce for ounce, Lux does up to twice as many dishes as other leading soaps tested? If I get my hands on a box of Lux Flakes, I'll go easy with it. I don't want to waste a spoonful. Yes, Lux is precious, Mrs. Green. Too precious to be wasted. Of course, you're disappointed when you can't find Lux Flakes right off. We're making as much as we can, but there just isn't enough to satisfy all our customers all the time. So please be patient and keep asking. When you do find Lux Flakes, you'll be delighted how soft and smooth they leave your hands, in spite of dishwashing. Here's Mr. Keeley at the microphone. Now that you've met them in St. Louis, we invite you to meet them as they are in real life. Tonight's delightful stars, Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake. Judy, we enjoyed both your singing and your acting. <laughs> well, Bill, tonight's play certainly puts one in the mood for Christmas. You know, Christmas is only 23 days away. <laughs> hey, that's pretty close figuring, Margaret. And, Judy, this will be the first Christmas for the newest member of your family. Have you bought the baby any presents yet, Judy? Well, I haven't done much shopping yet, Margaret. Judy's been pretty busy. It was just recently she finished her latest metro golden Mare Technicolor picture, Till the Clouds Roll By. And Margaret's been pretty busy, too. She's been appointed National Junior Chairman of the Infantile Paralysis Fund. Just three weeks and 48 hours until Christmas. <laughs> and during the Christmas holidays, Margaret, you'll have to see Tom Drake's new MGM picture, Courage of Lassie. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Margaret has one of Lassie's puppies. Is that right, Margaret? Yes, and I named him Laddie. But just think only 18 shopping days until Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, Margaret. And we've been doing some shopping on a play for next week. What are you presenting next week, Bill? Two brilliant stars who rank among our greatest favorites, Irene Dunn and Walter Pidgeon. <laughs> they appear in one of the screen's most entertaining comedies, Columbia Pictures' recent hit, Together Again. It's the fresh, delightful story of a woman torn between love and her career as a small-town mayor, a play I'm sure our audience will love. Well, Irene Dunn and Walter Pidgeon really make a great team, Mr. Keeling. And remember, only 20, uh, 23 days until Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and remember, too, the days are getting shorter, Margaret. Gee, that makes things even better. <laughs> Good night. Good, Good night. night. <laughs> and best holiday wishes to you all. <laughs> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Irene Dunn and Walter Pigeon in Together Again. This is William Keeley saying good night to you from Hollywood. More than two million servicemen returning to civilian life are homeless. Help out by making your extra rooms available to rent and by listing your sales or rentals with the Veterans Housing Center. Judy Garland, Margaret O'Brien, and Tom Drake appeared by arrangement with Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer, producers of The Secret Heart. Heard in our cast tonight were Gail Gordon as Alonzo, Colleen Gray as Rose, Regina Wallace as Mrs. Smith, Norman Field as Grandpa, and Billy Roy, Noreen Gamil, Dick Ryan, Clark Gordon, Charles Seal, Truda Marson, Johnny McGovern, Joel Davis, Jerry Farber, Howard Jeffrey, and Lois Kennison. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This program is broadcast to our men and women overseas 
through cooperation with the Armed Forces Radio Service. And this is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy, reminding you to tune in again next Monday night to hear Together Again with Irene Dunn and Walter Pidgeon. That was Meet Me in St. Louis on the Lux Radio Theater. And of course, at the end of the episode, the new baby the cast was discussing was none other than little Liza Minnelli. The great Liza Minnelli. She was nine months old at that point when they would have filmed, uh, or pardon, uh, recorded that, uh, that radio play. Mm -hmm. So how was the film received when it, uh, in its original run? Uh, I, I was uh, insinuating before that, you know, a lot of people on the MGM lot did not believe in this project, but because it seemed to have no plot and uh, it turned out to be MGM's top grossing musical of the forties. It was their absolute biggest uh, musical hit. It's a great score. Uh, you know, it, at least three indispensable songs to American culture with the trolley song and uh, the Boy Next Door, and of course, Have Yourself a Merry Little Christmas, one of the you know big hits of the 20th century. Um, it it was an extraordinarily big hit, and 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 Vincent got to prove everyone wrong, which must have felt so nice for him artistically. He stuck to what he did best, and uh, and he taught MGM the the the, the, the leaders of the game a new way of approaching uh, movie musicals. Mm -hmm. And that is just so impressive. He's, right. he's just such an impressive artist. This is, yeah, it was really one of the, the great early contributions before leading us into the, you know, the, the, the real oh, high golden, right. in the fifties with, you know, Gene Kelly and singing in the rain mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. This really mm -hmm. does feel like it's the start. Now, somebody the, financially of the forties, well, that which sure. kind of blows my mind. If I, if I think through them all, like, yeah, it's, it's the one that made the most money as far as I've read. Now, of course, while Judy Garland uh, is the star of the film, uh, at, at almost every turn, she risks being upstaged by uh, little Margaret O'Brien. True. Uh, a little bit about her. Who was Margaret O'Brien? And what happened to Margaret O'Brien? Uh, Margaret O'Brien, you know, uh, I, I think from, from what I can glean, her, her wonderful talent and her eagerness um, on the set just gave Judy the willies. Mm -hmm. She couldn't help but see a little ghost of her own self, of, of somebody that MGM was gonna maybe ruin mm -hmm. by working super hard and they did work her hard. I, I think Margaret O'Brien had made two or three other films just that year. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, they had their own version of Shirley Temple on their hands for the first time really. And she wasn't, as adorable as Shirley Temple, she was uh, she was tough and straight talking, and that was so fun and refreshing. She could get a laugh and a one liner so well. You know, there there, there was a great talent there, and um, and Judy worried for that certainly, and and what could be done about that. She um, could buy on a dime too. She could just she burst into tears. The stories that the reason that she would so so yeah, who were the crying queens at MG at MGM? It was June Allison, and who was a great friend of Judy's, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and Margaret O'Brien, and uh, apparently Margaret O'Brien's own mother would pull her in the corner and tell her that her dog was going to be murdered that night. <laughs> this, this, uh, th she would mentally abuse her this way, you know, um, to make sure that the tears were there because Mama wanted that little girl to be a star. And Judy saw herself and her mother in that. Mama wants that little girl to be a star, and so she will put anything into her head to get the camera to get that real life terror. Mm -hmm. um, and 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 so Margaret was being manipulated quite a lot. Now Judy survived that kind of manipulation uh, through her mother and through MGM to grow up to be a great adult star. And that was not the case for Margaret O'Brien. She, she did not transition into adulthood mm -hmm. the way that Judy did. Um, she was recognized though um, with one of those junior Oscars like Judy got back, back at the time, back during Wizard of Oz. She got one of those junior Oscars for her performance uh, in Meet Me in St. Louis as uh, Louis as well as other films. Um, and uh, did, have you heard the story about her Oscar? It was weird. Apparently her Oscar got like um, moved or taken away by um, 
a housekeeper who was polishing it and gave it to oh. somebody else to help with the work. And then it didn't get returned. And then Margaret O'Brien's Margaret O'Brien's mother died. And then they lost contact with that housekeeper. And she went years and years and years without her statuette. It was just out there in the world. And it was at the night, it was in 1995. It was in, in the nineties during a flea market, a couple of collectors found it, a little statuette with her name inscribed on it for, for maybe $500 at a flea market. Wow. And they scooped it up and took it to MGM to, to, to put in a, into a proper like place and auction. And it did get back into Margaret O'Brien's life, wow. you know, much, much, much later wow. in her life. So she ended up with it, but my goodness, um, it, I don't think that her movie memories were co all completely fond ones. No, no, well, that must have been traumatic for her. Yeah. yeah. So to wrap it up, what did Judy think about this film after the fact, years later? Did the <laughs> after the fact, she goes directly to Arthur Freed, one of the d d um, producers at MGM and says, hey, don't ever let me tell you how to make a film again because she was so wrong about the script. You know, I told you she she just thought it was it was trite. There was nothing to it. She didn't want to play a little girl. Uh, it, th that it was just some boring little kitchen sink nothingness mm -hmm. and uh, and realized she was totally wrong that there's the, the, the expansive emotional life that's so beautifully painted on the screen is um, changed musicals forever. And so it did become very, very fond of Judy. Um, when she fell in love with Vincent uh, uh, throughout the course of the filming, by the time filming ended, it was, I think, three months later that they moved in together. Wow. That she moved into his house, got her divorce finalized from her first husband, um, orchestra leader, David Rose. Mm -hmm. And um, of course, shortly thereafter, Liza Minnelli uh, comes into the world she gave birth to Liza and we listened to the radio play and Liza is nine months old. Mm -hmm. um, but even by then, it was 1946 when this radio play version happens, um, Judy and Vincent are starting to deteriorate. Mm -hmm. Actually, by this time, MGM wanted a new contract out of Judy and um, she felt like it was pretty much forced on her against her will, uh, the, 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 terms of this new contract and and blamed Vincent for that whether that is a place to put that blame or not and was already uh beginning to uh let that relationship die in her heart we Judy went on to have five husbands and um she was beginning to fall out actually with Vincent by the time that you're listening to this they're gonna start filming the pirate Mm -hmm. which he directed and she started with Gene Kelly a couple months after this, two or three months after that, I think that this is filmed and the pirate was when they really uh, hit heads right. when she felt, Oh, you're so much more interested in Gene than me. You, you, yeah. you take care of his scenes more than my scenes. You take care of his costumes more than my costumes, all of that. And, and they, they begin to fall out. Right. So it's a, it, it was a wonderful romance in which they remained lifelong friends absolute love and respect for one another throughout both of their lives but the marriage wasn't to last terribly long right well it's wonderful that we've got the film on screen and then again her, allowing her to revisit a role that was such a highlight of her life both mm -hmm. personally and professionally and thank you so much angela ingersoll uh my my go-to of any judy garland question ever thank you're so miraculous much. and i'm so delighted that you joined me today oh thank you so much i've had a wonderful time getting to spend just a little bit of um just a little bit of holiday good cheer with you as mm -hmm. as we are remote finding these radio plays it's such a wonderful idea you've had of, of helping bring people together this way so thank you for that thank you so much Theaters across the country need your support now, more than ever. We hope you'll consider a donation to Porchlight Music Theater today. Just go to porchlightmusictheater.org. Until next time on Classic Musicals from the Golden Age of Radio, I'm Michael Weber.